I would like to thank the ASCO organization for the invitation to present this venue where I present the perspective that we do get value from the medications we use for the treatment of myeloma. And um, I'm not here to convince you only that we can afford them, but also that we cannot afford not to move forward the needle of innovation. After my talk, you'll see each one of the slides uh, presented and posted in Twitter with also a short video that explains in greater detail uh, my perspective. My opponent in this debate is a good friend and colleague, Dr. Raj Kumar, and we have both shown a disposition to debate ideas and be topical. Of course, none of his work and advocacy will be criticized. Lastly, I want to thank my collaborator, uh, Ms. Jennifer Hinkle, who's an economist and a cancer survivor, who helped also with the writing of the paper that I invite you all to read. Now, this is my disclosure slides that shows the names of some of the companies uh, with which I have uh, worked over the years to advance the treatments uh, for our, our patients. And of course, what you will hear today may sound different from the common narrative regarding the cost of medications. And my only plea to you is that you listen openly to what I am about to say. Now, this is my favorite slide shows the survival of multiple myeloma. Obviously, we've made tremendous progress, and you can see that even in two-year increments, the survival of patients continue to improve. But it's very clear that our job is not done. In the words of Dr. Paul Richardson, the disease is humbling. Now, there are many things that my good friend uh, Vince and I agree, as you can see here, and I will not talk, for instance, about the price of generics because they should be inexpensive, but we will uh, show this agreement on some fundamental principles. I do not think that the evidence shows that the rise, of price, the rise in the price of drugs is faster than anything else in healthcare. I will tell you that most patients can access these medications and uh, obviously can afford them. And I will argue that these drugs provide value. And I am not sure that at this point something must uh, be done. So for the first point, is it true that uh, these drug prices are skyrocketing? Well, it's good to remember that drugs compose only a small fraction of the total healthcare, 10%. If you focus exclusively on cancer, they're 20%. And in the case of myeloma, it's even higher, 25 to 29%. However, as a component of everything we do in healthcare, drugs on, uh, cancer drugs only constitute 1%. So that's a very tiny drop. And if we were to make those drugs um, for free today, the economic literature is unequivocal. Innovation will stop. And all of what we see here and what we know, ASCO, ASH, etc., would cease to exist as we currently know it. And I ask you, is that a price that we are willing to pay for that 1%? Now, in the bottom part of my slide, I show you the net increase in the price of drugs for 2016 and 17 by three studies. Now, this is at large, and I will get down to my loma later. And as you can see, most of them are under 2%, which is quite close to uh, inflation. However, you might ask yourself, that is not what I hear in the news. So uh, this slide highlights a topic that is often uh, not uh, mentioned in uh, the press media or in some uh, medical articles regarding the cost of drugs. Uh, there is a list price and then there is a net price, which is actually what people pay for these drugs. And I will tell you, and you should know, no one pays list price. We'll talk about rebates later. Now, there's a process of negotiation, and there's a, a role here that is played by these groups called the PBMs, or the Pharmacy Benefit Managers. Um, and they are secret negotiations where uh, rebates are secured by the purchasers of uh, these drugs. Now, there's a lot of things that are currently under discussion regarding the PBMs, including the fact that patients may be charged co-pays that are based on list price, even when people are paying uh, net price. And I think uh, reducing this intermediary price uh, uh, portion of the budget would appear to be very important. So, however, the forecast, as you can see here for the next four years, is that the rate of increase will be approximately one world. Now, uh, what about value? Let's look at the macro level. Murphy has published that a 1% reduction in cancer mortality would have a net economic benefit for uh, current and future generations of approximately 500 billion. And if we had a magic wand that could cure all forms of cancer, so we wouldn't need ASCO anymore, that would have a value of approximately $50 trillion. Now, a study just recently published in Cancer showed that between 2010 and 15, uh, cancer mortality has dropped by 1.5%. So that net value of that 1.5% is 750 
uh, billion. And I can tell you we are not spending nearly close to that number when it comes down to cancer uh, medications. Now, um, my point again is we do get value. In 2010, like Dawala and colleagues published on the economic benefits of the war of cancer. So they had to look that over a long period of time. So they uh, looked at older dates, 1988 to 2000. Uh, there were 23 million uh, additional life years given to patients with an economic value of 1.9 trillion. And the upper end of the estimates of what was spent in the care of cancer patients and also what was spent at the time in R&D does not exceed $400 billion. So patients accrued at least 80% of this economic benefit. Now, in this slide, I show you that when we talk about value, people should never conflate this with cost or even cost effectiveness. There's, there's positive aspects that should be brought forward in the equation of value. So the same group analyzed uh, a number of cases and proposes a new metric, the quality adjusted cost of care, which uh, uh, considers not only the cost, but also the economic benefit of interventions. And one of their studies was multiple myeloma. They clearly show that the yearly spending in the care of myeloma went up from the years 2004 to 2009 from 36,000 to 109,000. Now this period was chosen because that's precisely when benefit, the benefit of portezomib and lenalidomide started to be realized. And what they realized is that the, there was a, a net economic benefit of $67,000 less being spent that was being spent before if you consider the economic value of this um, interventions. Okay, but what about patients? So patients get their uh, medications. And um, uh, there's a study that was published in, uh, looking at the years 2011 to 2013, which showed that 91% of patients who receive IMIDs from diplomat specialty pharmacy, and this is close to 80,000 patients, would be paying less than $100. Now, I will be the first one to say that $100 is substantial for some families with limited means, but it's quite different from what you see in the lay press. The graph on the right shows a decrease in copay net after financial assistance. Now, um, recently I was interviewed by a major news outlet in anticipation of the comments by President Trump regarding his plan for drug prices. And I cited a study like this, and the study came out saying that myeloma patients are spending thousands of dollars per month in copays. That is certainly possible, but as the study shows clearly, that is really not very common. Now, Dr. Dusetsina showed that in 2016, the median copay for specialty drugs is $35. Again, different from the stories you hear in the news. So obviously, I was curious uh, whether I was missing something and whether patients could get the drugs. So I went to the website of a patient advocacy group, Patients for Affordable Drugs, that specifically looks for stories of people having difficulty in accessing their medications. I filtered out for myeloma and also for my state and the state of my opponent, Arizona. And Minnesota. And uh, I could not find a single story of patients not getting their medicines. The only stories were two comments in the state of Arizona stating that uh, they were worried about what they had heard in the news about the price of drugs, and uh, but no stories of patients not being able to receive those medications. And this was accessed in April of 2018. And in fact, last but not least, my colleague Dr. Raj Kumar at Mayo Clinic Medical Grand Rounds stated that when he talked to the nurses, he was surprised to hear that all of the patients get the medications. So in fact, patients do get the medicines, and obviously in consequence, they have to be considered affordable. But there is a catch. So here's a catch. If you have commercial insurance, you can get direct copay assistance from the pharmaceutical company. So the majority of people, for instance, who would uh, uh, receive something like lenalidomide would pay less than $25 per month, period. This is clear. If you have commercial insurance, uh, you can usually do that unless you have an excessive uh, amount of income. Patients with no insurance, we can usually secure medications for free uh, from the manufacturers. The problem is with Medicare patients. So Stark laws that uh, prevent uh, kickbacks do not allow direct copay assistance. So this assistance is funneled through third-party organizations like patient foundations or the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. And obviously something would, some would see this as nefarious, uh, the reality is if we don't have this, patients are not going to have access to their medications. And until we have a better system, this should not be removed. I am particularly appalled that bioethicists are not calling this out. Since this is a vulnerable stage of a patient's uh, uh, course in, in cancer, they're facing end-of-life uh, care, uh, potentially death, 
and we're trying to apply consumerism pressure, that is, trying to uh, pressure patients to decide whether they really need that medication or not. Just think about that. Lastly, economies have shown that interfering, interfering with copay assistance is just simply a bad idea. Okay, well, what about bankruptcy? I fear that patients can go bankrupt. Well, uh, the reality is that uh, bankruptcy increases with a diagnosis of cancer. Um, Dr. Ramsey has shown that in the state of Washington, the new cancer diagnosis doubles the rate of bankruptcy from 1.7 to 0.7. However, this and all other studies have never, never associated medical bankruptcy with drug copays. There are many other factors. Patients have expenses such as hospital and doctor bills. They have to travel. They have to incur meals. Perhaps as important, if not more, the patient and the caregiver cannot work, so there's no income to the family, and many of these families have uh, economic fragility with limited life savings. Now, if you apply the same principles in some of the studies, you will be surprised to know that the Fraser Institute has reported that the rate of medically-induced bankruptcy is exactly the same in Canada. Now, most recently, with more um, developed criteria, the New England Journal of Medicine published a study that the title included the myth of bankruptcy induced by medical expenses, where they estimate the net of medical bankruptcies only about being at 4%. Okay, but we need to measure things. So how do we do that? Well, one of the ways is to use a quality. The quality is a quality adjusted life years, and it really is a metric to value life uh, post-cancer diagnosis with discounts associated with decreased quality of life or toxicity. Uh, but it's not very clear that patients who have read this in detail agree. And if anything, uh, many patients uh, state that the value of life for them post-diagnosis is greater than what the value of life was before the diagnosis. Many of you perhaps have an idea of what you're going to do in six months. Many patients know it down to the week or to the day. And um, uh, several bioethicists have pointed out the limitations of quality. Perhaps the classic article is that one of Harry's, more recently uh, one from uh, Pettit, all of the cited in my slides. Uh, it has been made to be very clear that qualis should not be used to deny treatment and um, taken to an extreme quality uh, discriminates and creates ageism. Now, this is a very important point. Absent an equivalent metric does not make us uh, be ready to morally justify the use of quality. So if we are to use a metric, I'm going to suggest that we use uh, life uh, years. Okay, well... Still, we need to have metrics, and I think we will be dealing with this. So one of the ways to do this is through the so-called value frameworks. However, you should know that currently none of them cover myeloma well. Some of this has been done through NCCN, ASCO, and perhaps uh, one of the most uh, notable ones has been ICER. They all fail to account for patient preference and clinical and biological heterogeneity. As an example, I'll tell you that ICER held a meeting in St. Louis, the Midwest meeting, where they talked about myeloma and the treatments for myeloma. This meeting was greatly criticized for the lack of stakeholder input, including several letters from patient support organizations. For those of you in the room who treat myeloma, just know that their conclusion was that Panovinostat provided the best value. And there's also a significant issue with bias in the voting panel. Just before the voting of uh, value, a member of, of the panel raises his hand and states, no matter how effective or how non-toxic these drugs are, just know that I'm going to vote for low value for those medications. And the reason for that is that I think this money is best spent in roads and schools. Obviously, philosophically, a very valid opinion, but not for someone who's voting on whether patients with myeloma should receive these drugs or not. Just imagine the opposite, 180 degrees, where a member of the pharmaceutical company was a voting member in that panel and raised a hand and said, no matter how toxic or ineffective these drugs, I will vote and say that uh, these drugs are of high value. We simply would not accept that. So we have to be very, very careful. Now here I show you the pharmacoeconomic studies that have been um, uh, done recently for some of the myeloma combinations, uh, looking at uh, essentially triplets versus doublets. I show you the quality, the time cost, and also the incremental cost to achieve uh, that quality. And as you, you know, and we all know, those combinations are quite expensive. Now, the first point I'm going to make is, uh, and I'll, I'll come back to the compound, is that I told you I don't believe in the Q and the A of quality. So if I make an upwards correction for these numbers using similar discounts that were taken for the quality, uh, you will see actually that uh, uh, the majority of these regimens fall under what others accept, by the way, not me, 
cost effectiveness uh, for these uh, combinations. Now, this study is never consider those rebates. And recently, Janssen, Merck, and Lilly published the rebates, and this went from anywhere from 42 to 51% between list price and net price. So conservatively, I'm going to use a 25% rebate, which can also be used to discount what we're paying for the set of medications. And obviously, in the real world, we combine both of them. So the rebate and the lack of quality leads me to that conclusion and the suggestion that, in fact, we do get, uh, based on others' uh, metrics, uh, the uh, cost effectiveness that we need for the majority of the myeloma treatments. The only one that is still highlighted in orange is the daratumumab RD combination, which parenthetically is one of the most effective regimens we have, short of what we're going to learn about CAR T cell therapies. Now, we did a study with real world spending, and we show again that the total uh, all uh, healthcare costs have gone up substantially for myeloma from the year 2000 to the year 2014, where we're paying. Uh, close to $14,000 per month. Now, this is averaged out over the lifespan of the patient, and this includes uh, months when the patients are under active treatment and when they're not. And also, the cost of um, the myeloma drugs has also gone up, um, and they can constitute close to 30%. However, as should be seen from the graph, the cost of the drugs is, is not the only and not necessarily the key driver of the increase in spending in myeloma uh, care. Now, for those of you who like less is more, let me suggest this data that sometimes spending in these drugs is beneficial. So the United States has a GDP of 1.6 trillion, of which we spend 17% in healthcare versus the European Union, which is about half the GDP, and they spend just shy of 11%. Okay, of that fraction that we spend on, on healthcare in the US, we spend 4.8% in oncology, so slightly less what they spend in the EU at 4.9 despite the fact that we spend close to 20% of uh, our money there in cancer drugs, whereas the European Union only spends 11% of their money. So again, I think this uh, potentially shows the benefits that are realized from preventing hospital uh, stays and other of the economic benefits that comes with innovation. So some would say, well, we need more regulations. How? Medicare. Well, it's not clear that Medicare negotiations are going to lead to better pricing. In fact, uh, several studies, and actuarial studies and governmental studies have concluded that, uh, that Medicare would have very limited ability to do that. And in reality, when you talk about Medicare negotiation, you really are talking, whether you like it or not, about price fixing. Just be reminded that some of the purchasers of drugs in the United States have greater power of uh, negotiation than, than many countries in the European Union. So in fact, the only way that Medicare could negotiate would be one, by saying no, or two, which is a little bit more palatable, would be through the creation of formularies. And those can exclude certain life-saving medications. Is this far-fetched? Of course not. Recently, I published that the VA uh, system does have certain limitations on medications that are not included in their formulary. And parenthetically, you should know that the VA is planning to work with ISAC. So, I think it should be very clear that we should avoid market interference. The patented drugs of now are the generics of the future, and uh, absent innovation, there's no future generics. Now, we may not like this in medicine, but the economic literature is unequivocal about this. If you start controlling prices, you will slow or kill innovation, period. That is well established in the academic literature. I would ask you to reject coercive proposals, things like eminent domain. Some people have proposed that the government marches in with rights over the patented medications. Now, these drugs make sense when people were building railroads, and if you were the owner of that last lot that just was next to the ocean, perhaps, you didn't want to hold the government hostage, so the government created these rules for that. I would suggest to you that using eminent domains when it comes down to intellectual property is more like building a railroad, so it purposefully goes right over oil fields and gold mines. And the same is true for international laws for compulsory licensing. And do I really need to explain the nonsense of importing patented drugs, given the protections of intellectual property uh, we all need to have? Now, don't single out myeloma. I tell you, these discussions are not as relevant in GBM. Unlike myeloma, most cancers still have limited options. And as you should know, that in other sessions in this particular meeting, people are discussing non-innovative approaches, so, such as prophylactic cranial irradiation for lung cancer. Now, may I suggest to you that this bullish environment that we see in myeloma attracts investors, and people sometimes worry about this. We should welcome investors. We don't want them in, in other 
uh, areas of the economy such as communications or transportation. And this is probably one of the reasons why we have had this golden era of drug development in myeloma. So what are the potential improvements? Of course, we want to get better value. And I use the word improvements purposefully instead of solutions because I am not certain that there is a problem. But if we are to create greater value, I may suggest that we accelerate the drug approval, which is currently one of the goals of the current FDA commissioner. I would accelerate the transition to patented, uh, of patented medications to generic. I would minimize the role that third-party players play in the supply chain, particularly the PBMs. I would ask that you never put the patients in the middle, particularly when it comes down to the current system and copay assistance. Uh, one of the models that uh, we and others have been, uh, proposed, and in fact were included in the comments by President Trump, is that we do reference pricing. Now, you cannot force other countries, perhaps, to pay for drugs at the price you want. But we can, either through trade agreements, uh, uh, ask for similar pricing be done uh, with countries with similar GDP per capita or um, um, actually make this uh, be a mandatory requirement for companies that sell drugs in the United States. It should be said again, the United States subsidizes biotechnology development for the rest of the world. And I think some European countries should pay more. Now, we of course like our colleagues and we give them a break but the, because they present in the fastest way possible phase three clinical trials. But if you're not sure, maybe just do nothing. So to conclude, I think we are very fortunate in multiple myeloma because of the progress we've seen in innovation. I think we all agree that today's best is simply not good enough. I would trust my opponent with my life were I to be diagnosed with multiple myeloma, but I think he's wrong on drug economics. I think we're a combination or a drug away from curing many myeloma patients. And if you have a patient that you cannot get them drugs, send them to me. Thank you very much.